Um, hi, and welcome to the, I guess this is the inaugural 2022 webinar of, um, of the Fever's uh, webinar series. And today we are on with the Avian Vet Insider with Dr. Lamb. So, uh, well, well, first of all, welcome everybody to 2022 for our webinars and Dr. Lamb, welcome back. It's always great to see you and Arroyo with us as well. Good to see you too. And today, so we were just talking about this earlier. It's actually what is uh, what's going on this month. It is National uh, Heart Health Month. So tying into that, we've got a topic on um, uh, cardio health. So uh, we're kind of doing the, the the heart health theme um, to kickstart our webinar. I guess we'll call it our webinar season um, of 2022. So, um, and I also have a really cute video that we're going to share because who does not like a cute bird video? And um, let me see if I can get this to play. And, and I imagine you're doing a screen, you're gonna share your screen with us. I right? am, yes. I've got some slides and stuff for us to accompany the uh, uh, show today. <laughs> okay, okay, good, good. Um, okay, let me do a screen share. Let's see, it's been a while, I'm a little rusty. We haven't been doing this, we do a little break from our webinars. Um, okay, let's see here, there we are. All right, Aurora, are you ready for some ink cakes? These are great for you. Oh no, Let's is it doing the double thing again? All right, Aurora, are you ready for some ink cakes? I will. These are great for you. Let's make it a little bit more difficult for you. Ah. Classic baby cakes. All right, do you think we can get that? So you want to give us a play-by-play? -play? Yeah, so he's uh, pretty good at foraging. You can see that's kind of a higher tier foraging toy for you there. You have to have those two keys exactly um, right to get them to be pulled out and to be able to get the um, tre treasure chest to open up. And then even when he has the treasure chest open, now he has to like pull it up to himself because where I placed it made it harder for him to actually get to. But um, while he was getting the the treasure chest up, there was actually some construction going on next door. So this is his pause as he is listening to the construction because it happened like just perfectly at the the time when uh, you kind of wouldn't want it to. <laughs> so now I had to remind him that oh yeah we're foraging right I had to encourage him again <laughs> to get back to it. Do you think that was him thinking that was part of the foraging uh, the foraging challenge was to figure out what the what that noise was? It was like oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe. So foraging snack. Oh nice. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that that face of like satisfaction and I, I conquered this. So <laughs> yep. And it's nice because the Ava cake also in and of itself is a foraging um device too, right? The way that it's made together is multiple different textures, uh, different food pieces and everything. So he has multiple levels of foraging going on there, um, which is great. You know, we never really talk about it, but when you when you look at that too, you're kind of uh, promoting foot health because you really got to grasp that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, that was uh, always adorable to see uh, our, our the, the cutest food tester in the world here is a royal uh, with the <laughs> Yep. <laughs> All right. So, Dr. Lamb, um, let's see. I, I'm going to, did I give you screen share? Uh, let me make you. Yeah, it looks like I've got the ability to screen share now. So, there we go. All right. All right. So I'll let I'm you take it away. And once again, our topic is, is uh, cardiovascular health. It's going to be uh, in tying in with the uh, Heart Health Month of February. So, all right. All right. Here we go. Let's get to the slideshow here. All right. So thank you guys for uh, coming and attending today. So we're going to start off 2022 talking about uh, cardiac disease in, in birds. It's something that we're learning a lot more about, um, something that I'm sure a lot of our viewers have been hearing about maybe more when they go to talk with their veterinarians, whether it's just uh, during wellness visits, maybe veterinarians are talking about, hey, you know, we're seeing these sort of problems. This is things that we can do to try to prevent these issues. Um, so I think this is a really good talk for us to get into today um, to learn more about heart health. Okay, so as I've done with many of my other talks in the past, um, I always want to 
go over uh, anatomy and physiology a little bit because it's really helpful for us to understand what's going on because we have to know how the body works in health to understand how it works in disease states. And so we have to learn the anatomy, learn the physiology, know what's normal, and then we can understand what happens when it's abnormal and how things can go wrong. So just to start off with, um, the heart has four chambers. It's two atrias and, and two ventricles that are present. And um, the um, way that sort of looks, I have some pictures in the subsequent slides that I'll show you, uh, but the atria are smaller and sort of sit at the top of the heart. Um, and then the ventricles are larger and kind of like at the, the bottom portion of the heart. There are vessels that branch up off of the heart, um, bl blood vessels that are going to the heart, blood vessels that are leaving the heart. Um, the great vessels that branch off the heart um, are the ones that are supplying blood to the body, right? So you have your heart and your heart is essentially this pump. Um, and then you have these great vessels that are branching off and they are taking blood out to the body. Now, uh, we also need to know the differences in what those vessels are. And so you'll hear people talk about uh, arteries, veins, or capillaries. Those are sort of our main vessels that we have with, uh, within our cardiovascular system. Uh, but they all do slightly different, like there's different components. Um, so it's important to know what arteries, veins, and capillaries are to understand how things work. So arteries are the vessels that flow away from the heart. Most of your arteries, but not all of them, contain um, oxygen and in high concentrations and are also important for providing nutrition uh, to the cells of the body. Capillaries are these really small vessels. So usually you have your arteries um, branching away from the heart. They're flowing away from the heart, taking that blood out to the body where they go to the capillaries, which is the site of gas exchange. And that's also where nutrients are exchanged as well. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. <coughs> so I apologize if I cough at all during this. Um, so at those capillaries, um, the gas of oxygen gets released out to the tissues. And then actually that's where your carbon dioxide, which is in your cells, gets loaded back on uh, into those, uh, into the, the blood there. And then it goes through the veins. Now your veins are flowing towards the heart. So after the capillaries, you have your veins and your veins are going back to that heart to bring blood back to the heart. Most, but not all of your veins are high in carbon dioxide, um, which is that sort of gas that's the cellular waste product and low in oxygen. And they're also carrying sort of cellular waste and debris and that sort of stuff. So just some analogies to consider the, what is the cardiovascular system like? Because, you know, when we think about this, this, um, anatomical system, sometimes it's hard to wrap your mind around that. And it's hard to really conceptualize it. So we try to compare it to other things to help us understand it a little bit more. Um, and one thing that you can kind of compare it to is think of the cardiovascular system like plumbing. So plumbing in this picture of this, this house in, in uh, plumbing within the house. So if you kind of think like, okay, here's the water heater, that's sort of like this pump. Um, and you have all these little drains and everything that are going to different parts of the house that are delivering water um, to different parts of the house, but then also wastes from those drains are kind of going back out. Um, or the other thing that people will often compare the cardiovascular system to is like city streets where you have all these different little intersecting areas um, that essentially what's happening is your cardiovascular system, system is acting like those city streets because there's a bunch of cars, which are like our red blood cells um, that are moving along those city streets and what's inside of those cars, little people. And those people are going out to the city and doing different things and coming back and going to their homes. Um, so they're delivering nutrients and gases where people are, you know, out and about doing deliveries or picking things up, bringing it back. Um, but cardiovascular system is the route that nutrients and gases 
travel around the body to get to cells, um, and also the way that the body takes debris to organs where it needs to, to be filtered out and it can get it out of the body, um, then it allows your whole body to act as this unified system. So the cardiovascular system is extremely important um, because it's really keeping everything together and communicating. So here is a little picture that is drawn of the cardiovascular system, and it's just a portion of the cardiovascular system. Again, the cardiovascular system is this very vast thing within the body. Um, and so what this picture is here is it's just trying to depict a little portion of the cardiovascular system, sort of the more major portion, the part that we often think about more um, in a veterinary setting. So here's actually a picture of the heart. Like I mentioned earlier, I was going to show you guys a photo. Again, it's just an artistic rendition of it, but you see you have the left uh, atria and the right atria. Those are the like little smaller portions of the chambers within the heart, and then the larger chambers, the ventricles, the right ventricle and left ventricle. If you look at the photo, you will see that the left ventricle is quite large. It's sort of the largest chamber in the heart, um, and in the bird, the right ventricle is just, it's still a large chamber, but it's a little smaller than the left ventricle. Um, and when blood is pumped out of that heart, it's going up through the aorta um, and going down to the body. And there's all these different vessels that are uh, major branches. So like one of our first branches, the celiac artery, uh, that is taking blood out to portions of the digestive system. Um, as you go further along here, you can see some names that sort of make sense. The testicular or ovarian artery, this one's taking blood to the reproductive tract. Uh, the renal artery, that's taking it to the kidneys. Um, so some of the, the way things are named, it makes sense for where blood is being delivered to. Um, also sort of up at that top of the aorta, the aorta starts to branch, but there is one major branch that comes off first, and that's the brachiocephalic trunk, and it branches into the left and right sides, and you can see your carotid arteries, um, subclavian artery, that actually goes to, well, the carotid arteries goes to the head, so that's supplying blood to the brain, um, the, the skull, the face, um, and subclavian artery is really important. That's the one that's supplying blood to the wing. Um, so all these different vessels are branching to all the different parts of the body um, where you are getting nutrition to. And then down here in this lower portion of the um, artistic rendition, so you have your artery here coming to a capillary. This is a picture of a capillary bed. So it's these teeny tiny little vessels that are microscopic um, that you would need a microscope to actually visualize. Um, and at that capillary bed, that's where your site of gas and nutrient exchange occurs. So those arteries, majority of them have high oxygen content, are bringing that high oxygen content down to that capillary bed. Oxygen gets offloaded, and this is a cell, and that oxygen goes down to that cell and does what it's supposed to do. Um, but then that cell uh, respires CO2, which is our waste gas. That then gets loaded back in the capillaries uh, to those blood vessels and goes into those veins, which is going to go back into circulation. This photo does not show the um, vein side of things. So this is just showing the artery side of things and just one example of what a little capillary looks like. So there's a whole lot more to this. This is much more complex. This is just a teeny portion of what uh, is actually going on. Okay. Um, now, there are some unique features of anatomy with birds. What I just described really is goes across the board for most animals. You know, mammal cardiovascular system um, is very similar to birds. Reptiles are a little different in certain aspects of what the actual heart looks like itself. We're not going to get into reptiles. We're only we're going to talk about birds today. Um, so, but I want to talk about some of the unique things about birds specifically that make um, us a little different from birds um, to understand some really fun facts about them. Um, so did you know that birds have a higher heart weight to body ratio than mammals? So if you think about that, um, what that means is they're like, again, the weight of that heart compared to the size of their body is larger than what it is for us. So they've got bigger hearts than us. Wow. They're, uh, they're very loving. <laughs> um, there's also some things that people will learn about if people are going to 
uh, you know, biology classes and even in high school, uh, people in, in high school biology will learn about the heart and they'll learn about the tricuspid and bicuspid valves. Um, and it's a little different actually for, for birds. The valves that are present within the heart that separate the atria and the ventricles um, are slightly different in their cusps compared to mammals. The left AV valve, that, that's atrioventricular valve, so the valve between the atria and the ventricle in mammals is bicuspid, meaning it has like two cusps that uh, essentially help to keep it open and close, open and close. But in birds, it's actually tricuspid, so it has three cusps. Um, now, in mammals, the right atrioventricular valve is um, tricuspid, but in birds, it's just this like muscular flap. So just a couple of different anatomy things for anybody who uh, is out there that is a, um, a anatomy uh, guru and wants to know a little bit more about the differences between birds and other animals. Also, um, the aorta in birds sort of ascends to the right, whereas in mammals, it ascends to the left. So if you look at this picture, we're going to go back for a second. This is the right side of the bird over here. The aorta kind of ascends to the right side. If this was a mammal, it would actually ascend over to the left side. So just a little unique thing. And then the brachiocephalic trunk, which was, again, in that last picture that I just showed, um, is larger in flying birds than the aorta. So those birds that are flying a lot, that, that brachiocephalic trunk is actually bigger than the aorta. A lot of times when people think about the aorta, we know it as, oh, it's the biggest uh, uh, vessel in the body. But in birds, the brachiocephalic trunk is bigger if they do a lot of flying. Now, if they don't do a lot of flying, um, then they will be um, the aorta that's larger. So for example, like the chicken, um, their brachiocephalic trunk is actually smaller than the aorta because chickens aren't flying. So they, the versus like a parrot, it's larger because what are they doing? They're flying. That's like their body is designed around flight. Um, and so they have to be able to get good blood flow to those wings so that they can do what they are designed to do. Um, so that's why it's larger. Okay, now we're gonna get into physiology. And I, I didn't want to do too much on the side of physiology because physiology, you know, we could talk about it forever and it's um, so much to talk about and definitely more than we need to cover for a little class like this. Um, I just wanted to go over the unique features of physiology in birds. So uh, interestingly, Flight has caused birds to develop a really high performance cardiovascular system that meets their needs for um, getting oxygen out to those, those cells. Uh, and because of flight, the, that, their system really is, is evolved around that function. Um, they have a higher stroke volume, which means with each beat of the heart, they're pumping out more blood than compared to a mammal. Um, their arterial blood pressure is higher compared to mammals. Um, and then also their, their cardiac output is higher um, compared to mammals. Uh, there is an electrical signal that goes through the heart that tells the heart how to contract because you need to have normal electrical signaling to tell that heart when to contract and move those muscles appropriately so the pump is working. And the way that the heart sort of depolarizes, which is how that electrical activity moves through the heart, is just a little different than the way that it does it in mammals. Um, so for anybody who's really into physiology that's watching this, um, they depolarize from the epicardium to the endocardium. So just making it so that they're ECG, if you're looking at an ECG on a bird, it actually looks different compared to a mammal. And I have that picture down here. And this is just a picture of African Gray, who is actually hooked up to an ECG machine. She's under anesthesia for her procedure here, but these little clamps are actually um, just connecting to an ECG machine so we can watch her electrical activity of her heart. And if you remember from like high school physiology or college physiology classes, um, you see an ECG as sort of this little wave form. And this one to the right is the mammals. So they have these different parts to the, the wave um, and mammals will have this big sort of spike up that's kind of going um, in a positive direction, you could say. Um, and birds are different. It looks like it's kind of flipped up, upside down. They have a big spike that goes down. So. 
um, their heart rate when they are flying, it increases two to four times during flight. So when they're just sitting there relaxing, um, it's one heart rate, but when they're actually flying, it goes up. I mean, that makes sense. You know, if we're sitting versus if we're running, we're going to have a higher heart rate. So it's not too odd, but it really increases substantially. Um, and then this fact down here, the very last one that I have, I think it's just a fun fact. So people can tell their friends about it, but a budgie in flight has a cardiac output seven times that of a dog during maximal exercise. So if you think about a dog, like a working dog, a, a, like a greyhound or something that is on a track and, and running, they need to have a lot of cardiac output because they are powering their ability to be running around, right? Um, and being at a high rate of speed. But a budgie is an even higher, like, Olympian athlete than a dog, <laughs> um, because it has to have seven times the amount of cardiac output that a dog does. It's just, it's really quite fascinating. Okay, that's all I wanted to talk about regarding the anatomy and physiology. If you want to know more about anatomy of the heart, physiology of the heart, there's like tons of information out there and you can uh, get very involved and in-depth. There is a, um, expert article on the anatomy of the heart actually on the Lefebvre website written by Dr. Susan Oros. Um, so if anybody wants to know more about it uh, after this webinar, you can go look it up and, and read this article. It's really great. Um, and also just helps you further appreciate just how awesome birds are. Okay. So now what we really wanted to talk about today is we wanted to get into um, cardiac problems. Um, and there's basically like two different types of cardiac disorders that we will see. There's congenital and there's acquired. And so congenital means that it's something that the animal is born with. Um, and so I've listed some examples of what those could be. Ventricular septal defects. So if you remember, we'll go back to our heart photo up here. This is the heart. So um, sometimes you can actually have a defect in the wall between the right and left ventricles um, where there's actually a connection between the two. It can happen in the atria as well. So between the left atrium and the right atrium, um, that's one of the congenital uh, defects that can be seen. And that uh, ventricular septal defects, that's the most common cardiovascular defect in that you'll see in birds. Whenever I've had um, a bird come in that has had a congenital cardiovascular problem, it, it's always been that ventricular septal defect. There's been a couple other little things here and there, but that's the most common one. Um, also valvular deformities, maybe those valves didn't form the way that they are supposed to between the atria and the ventricles. Um, and then also vascular malformations, like sometimes the way that the vessels are meant to be, uh, sometimes there are connections between different portions of the cardiovascular system that only exist while an animal is in more of an embryonic state and things are supposed to break down um, for when you're no longer an embryo and you've hatched out of the egg. Uh, and sometimes they don't. And so sometimes those vascular uh, malformations may remain uh, or those vascular developments may remain. And then as a you know, hatched animal um, now is considered a malformation because there might be some weird shunting of blood between the body that's not supposed to happen. Now, acquired cardiovascular problems, those are ones where something's happened in life. You know, so you were born with a perfectly normal heart, but then somewhere along the road uh, during life, something occurred to that cardiovascular system to make it so we have some abnormalities. Different acquired cardiovascular problems, aneurysms. Aneurysms are basically like a weak portion of the blood vessel. So you have your blood vessel, but then a portion of it is weak. And you can think of like a hose, um, like a garden hose or something, where if there's a weak portion of a garden hose, it could potentially burst. Um, that's essentially what an aneurysm is. There's like a weak portion of a vessel. And if pressure gets high, that, that little aneurysm can rupture. Um, congestive heart failure. That is probably the more common acquired cardiovascular disorder that you see across animals just across the board. Um, and congestive heart failure can happen secondary to lots of other cardiac diseases, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more. But what happens is some other cardiovascular disorders changes occur, and then that pump, because again, that heart is just this pump that's pumping 
blood around that vascular system in the body, the, if the pump isn't working great, then sometimes you get a backup of fluid that should be flowing through that vascular system. And if you get pressure changes within that, that are caused by that pump not working well, you get a backup of fluid, it could end up causing problems um, further on down the line in other organs. And again, we'll talk about that more in a little bit here. You can have infectious agents, bacteria, viruses, fungal problems. Uh, gout is something that we will see sometimes causing cardiovascular disease in birds and, and gout. Um, people get gout when birds get gout. It's a lot of times secondary to kidney problems, but basically there are these little crystals that the body is supposed to be excreting. It's called uric acid. The kidneys are secreting them, um, but they build up for one reason or another in the body. And if they get onto the heart, it can make it so the heart isn't so happy and not functioning great. Cancers do happen. Uh, we don't see a lot of them in, in birds uh, specific to the cardiovascular system, but it absolutely can occur. Um, arrhythmias. So we talked about, again, back to that physiology, we talked about the electrical activity that happens that stimulates that heart to contract. Um, and sometimes if that electrical activity isn't flowing the way that it's supposed to, then you can have an arrhythmia and that can then make it also so the heart isn't pumping the way that it really is meant to. Pericardial effusions are another thing that will happen, and that is where you actually get fluid that builds up around the heart. Now, that photo that I showed you of that little artistic rendition of the cardiovascular system did not show that there is actually a little sac, a um, little membrane that is around the heart called the pericardial sac, and there's just a tiny little layer of fluid that's within that sac, and sometimes more fluid fills up in there than is supposed to. And you get this fluid that's really around the heart, which can also lead to other problems. Now the big one, and what we're really gonna talk about mostly today is at the bottom of the list here, and that's atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis is something we are seeing more and more of in our companion birds. And there's still a lot we have to learn about it. There's still a lot we don't know, but we are constantly learning more. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So what is it? All right. So this picture is actually supposed to be a little artistic rendition of a blood vessel. And I'll go over it in a second. But what atherosclerosis is, the definition is it's this chronic inflammatory and degenerative disease of the arterial walls. So here is a normal blood vessel. And what this is, is this is like the actual uh, artery. Um, and it's just a cross section cut through the artery. This artery is coming around down here. And then it's like, we've essentially peeled off the top of the artery and cut it in half. So you're actually seeing the inside of the artery. So this black here area is kind of what's called the lumen. It's where uh, the blood cells, red blood cells, fluid, what's within your cardiovascular system is flowing through those tubes. You know, it's like the water in the hose, right? Um, there are different layers to that artery. So when you look at an artery, if you were to like cut that artery in half, as we have in this picture, there's three different layers to it. Uh, the innermost layer is called the tunica intima. So that's that name right there. And it's this little thin layer that's right in here. It's the just first inner layer of the vessel. The second layer is called the tunica media. And that's sort of where um, like some muscle can be. Um, and then the tunica externa is sort of just like connective tissue. And this is just a cross section of it, just trying to show the different layers essentially of a blood vessel of an artery. And the black, again, that's the area where that black area right there, that is where you are having blood flowing through. So this is a nice, clean, open vessel. So if we again, imagine it kind of like a hose or something like that, that's the center of the hose. It's clean, it's beautiful, it's perfect. Um, when you have atherosclerosis and you get that inflammation and degenerative changes to the inside of the arterial wall, what'll occur is you get this accumulation of inflammatory cells, fat, cholesterol, calcium, and just cellular debris that builds up and it builds up below there's in this intima the tunica intima there's a little layer below called the subintimal 
section or subintimal layer. And that's where all that gunk builds up. So this photo now is showing what happens when you have an atherosclerotic plaque. All this yellow stuff, what that is, is that those inflammatory cells, fat, cholesterol, calcium, all that gunk that's building up. And it causes that inner layer to sort of to bulge up, that um, endothelial lining to bulge up. So if we were to look at it in cross-section, now that black center where you're having blood flowing down through the vessel, it's smaller. So if you look at these two cross sections together, because you have that little yellow plaque, that's that little plaque of atherosclerosis that's in that wall, it's pushing into the lumen or the center. Um, so now it's harder for blood to flow through there. And if, again, we go back to our analogy of the cardiovascular system kind of being like city streets, Okay, if this is a city street and it's nice and wide and open and you're driving down a city street and the roads are clear, you're going to get to where you need to be really fast. Everybody's really happy, right? We all like to get to work on time or wherever we're going, traveling there on time. If you have atherosclerosis and you have a plaque in there, now it's harder for things to kind of be flowing through. You're going to get some backup. So imagine a car driving down this uh street um if there is now some traffic cones in the way and one of the segments of your lanes that you're driving down is blocked off and now you know if there's five people driving down this street and everything flows nicely because there's no traffic cones in the way but now you got some traffic cones in the way and one of your lanes is blocked and you just have five people driving down that street there's going to be a little bit of congestion cars are going to start to have to merge together things are going to pile up and depending upon how much you have going through there things could, you know, really get quite backed up or not. It just depends. Um, so that's sort of your little analogy of what's going on with atherosclerosis and how it's causing problems. Here's just another um, uh, artist rendition of what is going on in that little sub intimal layer and kind of how atherosclerosis happens. So again, we're going to go back to the physiology of why do these little plaques actually form? Well, there's still a lot we have to learn about. It. We don't totally 100% understand it, but it's thought that there is some response to injury hypothesis. That's the, the current thought, is that something damages the inner endothelial membrane. So here, this is the lumen, luminal side up here. This here is the endothelium. So it is that like first layer of that tunica intima and something damages that endothelial membrane of the blood vessel. And that damage makes the vessel wall leaky. So these inflammatory cells, this is the monocyte, it's one of the cells that uh, plays a role in inflammation in the body, um, is, a, is now able to move across that endothelial layer and get into the subintimal layer below. Um, and then inflammatory cells will phagocytize, phagocytize. And what that means is that they, they eat up um, other little things. And so what they're doing here is they're eating up some fats. So if there's an excessive amount of fats that are in that subintimal layer, those inflammatory cells sort of eat those little um, fats up essentially. And then it causes them to progress and turn into what's called foam cells. So you get these big, ugly cells that are just saying they're not really doing anything. Um, the foam cells die and then they become necrotic and then there's debris that's just sitting in that subintimal layer. And then that actually stimulates some smooth muscle cells from the lower layer, that tunica media layer, to be like, hey, something's not right. And they kind of move up and then they also will take up some of those fats and then they themselves turn into foam cells. And so it's this continual process where cells are moving and engulfing and taking up fats and things and then themselves transforming and then they form these plaques. And so you can see on this side of the image where nothing is happening, life is great. You have this nice big luminal space, but then as you get over to this side of the image where that plaque is growing, now you don't have a lot of space within the lumen. So it's essentially making that, um, the the inside of the vessel more narrow, congested, um, not getting as good flow around the body. So what happens then? If you're not getting, you have all these plaques that are developing within those vessels, there's several complications that can occur. Luminal stenosis, so that's what I was talking about, is where the inside of that blood vessel now is smaller. Stenosis means sort of like shrinking down. 
And so because you're not having as large of a size, you're not getting as good of blood flow around and you can get what's called ischemia. Ischemia is where you are not getting oxygen to tissues. So you're having a harder time getting blood vessels out to different parts of the body. And if you're having a harder time doing that, you're not getting oxygen as well out to different parts of the body. Now those cells are not happy because they are not getting the oxygen that they need because oxygen is important. The cells need to breathe oxygen. That's the most common thing that happens in birds is just ischemia, not enough oxygen to tissues. Other things can happen though. They can get what's called thrombosis, which is basically where you get like a clot. Um, you can have hemorrhaging. You can have aneurysms. Well, the aneurysm can happen first and then you can have the hemorrhaging. Um, but this, these sort of problems, the thrombosis, the hemorrhaging, aneurysms, they're more common in humans that have atherosclerosis, um, not as common in birds. So when we think about atherosclerosis in other animals, we have to worry about certain problems that, and have to think about totally different problems in the bird. And in one study, the, those other problems that we see more commonly in the mammal, with only 1.9% of lesions in birds. And so then we have to ask, well, why? Why, why are birds different than mammals. Why do mammals get those sort of side effects, but birds don't? And it's because, so mammals have platelets. Platelets are important for helping clot your blood. Birds technically don't have platelets. They have thrombocytes. They do the exact same thing. They're important for clotting blood, but they're different because they're an actual formed like single cell, whereas platelets actually come breaking off of a larger um, cell in the bone marrow. Um, and they're just like little fragments, essentially. Um, so the avian platelet actually has more functions than the avian thrombocyte has more functions than the mammalian platelet. And there's certain things the avian thrombocyte can't do, and it can't form what's called a shear resistant arterial thrombi and making these three-dimensional aggregates. So it's kind of good actually, because, um, we're just not really getting the that sort of problem where you get these big clots that form and like in people people will talk about like a stroke where you get a stroke because you get this big clot that forms it dislodged and it lodged somewhere and prevented blood flow through an area that's not happening so much in the birds the birds can't do that as easily so yay one for birds um <laughs> they don't have that as much of an issue um the other thing that can happen with atherosclerosis is cardiac infarction and that means that you're not getting good blood flow to that heart muscle itself. So, and I'm not talking about within the heart, the within the heart itself, I'm talking about the muscle around the heart because that heart muscle needs vessels going to it as well to supply it with blood. So it can function and it can get the oxygen that it needs. And so in people, you can have cardiac infarction or in mammals, I should say, because it can happen in other animals too. Um, in mammals, you can get cardiac in infarction um, because there's only, they have mammals, we have a smaller um, circulation, a smaller amount of circulation to the actual heart muscle itself, but birds um, were smart in making their hearts and they actually have more blood supply and more like collateral circulation around the muscle of their heart. Um, so they have like more deep branches and superficial branches and stuff. So they have better blood supply actually to the heart muscle so they don't get cardiac infarction really the way that um, mammals will. So again, yay, one for birds. But that was a, a mechanism of evolution that allows the bird to fly, right? They needed that to be able to pump, have that heart be pumping really well so that they could gain flight. Um, and then the other possible complication is congestive heart failure. And to just go over congestive heart failure again for a moment, what congestive heart failure is, is some underlying cardiovascular disease happens. In this particular case, we're gonna talk about atherosclerosis. You're not getting as good blood flow around the body. Blood essentially is backing up. Because blood is backing up, pressures are changed. Fluid can leak out of blood vessels and get into other parts of the body. The two main places that you have fluid leak to when you have congestive heart failure is either the thorax in the chest in, or in the abdomen. Now birds are unique and though they can get that fluid to leak out around the um, lungs and actually into the lungs, that's considered left-sided congestive heart failure. Because of the way that their heart anatomy is, they're more prone to right-sided congestive heart failure. So they're more likely if they go into congestive heart failure 
to have fluid leak into the abdomen as opposed to into the lungs. So you may see a bird with congestive heart failure not having as much respiratory distress as a mammal with congestive heart failure because mammals are a little more, not that they can't do it to the right, but they, a lot of our like dogs, cats tend to do it more to the left, um, birds do it more to the right. Uh, so just again, a little bit of physiological differences between birds and some other species. Okay, so I know that was a lot of information on how atherosclerosis is and, and it's something that you may need to take a little time to kind of wrap your mind around to totally understand it. I hope this webinar is making it a little bit easier to understand what is actually happening. I mean, the, the main thing really is that there is a blood vessel that has a plaque that develops in it, makes it harder for blood to flow around the body because now we've got this roadblock in the way. Now, um, who gets atherosclerosis? Now, the reality is, is lots of animals can get atherosclerosis, but when we're talking specifically about our pet birds, we have found that there are certain um, things that are certain species and certain historical things that make us go, okay, this individual is more at risk for atherosclerosis. So first thing is age. Now, it has been reported in young animals. And in fact, in chickens, it's been reported as early as four weeks of age. It can happen. But it tends to be a disease of higher age. So um, there seems to be a dramatic increase in the risk of atherosclerosis in birds that are 20 to 30 years of age. There was one study that found the median age uh, of birds, and this is Citizens specifically um, had that where atherosclerosis was developing was at 10.6 years of age. And this was across various different species. So we know that different species of parrots can live for various lengths of time. Some have shorter lifespans, some have a lot longer lifespans. Um, so you have to take that uh, median age there of 10.6 with a little bit of a grain of salt because it's taking into account all the different species of, of citizen birds. So it may be a little slightly skewed, a little lower um, than if we were to look at it by individual species of birds. There was another study that found the median age where there was a 50% prevalence of advanced atherosclerosis was in birds that were 30 to 40 years of age. So again, as birds get older, it's something that we see increasing the, the incidence of the disease. The other thing that is unfortunately uh, a risk factor is sex. Females, females are more prone to um, atherosclerosis um, than male birds are. Um, and we'll talk about why in just a moment here, but also wanna talk about species. Species, the Amazon, the African gray and the cockatiel, they're the poster children for atherosclerosis in the pet bird world. I put up there um, the, percent odds of getting atherosclerosis compared to other species. Uh, so the, for the African gray, this is based off of some studies that were done that were like retrospective studies where they went back and looked at a large volume of birds over a period of time that had presented to a pathology um, service and looked at, you know, why patients were dying. Um, they found that the African gray had 275% odds compared to other genera of parrots. So for developing atherosclerosis, the Amazon was 183% and the cockatiel was 146%. So it's pretty high um, incidence in these other species. Now, I don't want to scare anybody um, into thinking that, okay, well, if I have an African gray, I have atherosclerosis, have, my bird's going to get atherosclerosis. It doesn't mean that. It just means that their odds of having it is higher than compared to, say, a cockatoo or a conure. Now, there's several risk factors um, that we also look at that we've at least linked to atherosclerosis as far as exactly how they contribute. That's up for debate, I would say, still, but there's many thoughts and, and some, some good data that may support why some of these risk factors are a bigger problem. But um, so one thing is concurrent reproductive disease. And so that goes back to being female. Females are more prone to atherosclerosis than the males are. And the reason for it is we do also know as you go further down in this list here, we see um, high calorie, high fat diets, dyslipidemia. What that means is abnormal lipid profiles within the blood. So like 
your triglycerides are high, your cholesterol is high. Well, if you're a female bird and you're reproductively cycling, it is natural and normal for an increase in cholesterol, increase in triglycerides to happen during that time of being hormonal. And so you have these higher levels of triglycerides, higher levels of cholesterol naturally occurring because you're trying to take um, fats and get them to the um, ovary to make that nice big yolk that is going to be the little nutritional package for that baby that's developing within an egg. But if you're feeling hormonal all the time um, and you're staying hormonal throughout the year because you're a bird that's in captivity and maybe light cycles are off or external signals aren't quite what we would like them to be um, and you're feeling hormonal just all the time, your fat levels may be up all the time. And if you have constantly high fats, we do know that those fats are a big portion of those atherosclerotic plaques developing. And so if they're higher for a prolonged period, maybe they are, you know, contributing to atherosclerosis developing. Concurrent liver disease also is something that we will see as a risk factor associated with atherosclerosis. Um, the liver is really important in normal fat production. And so if the liver isn't functioning well, you could potentially have high fats associated with that sort of disorder. Again, just increasing your risk factor for atherosclerotic plaques developing. Limited physical activity. Remember, birds are meant to be flying. They are meant to be pretty active animals. They are meant to be athletes. And in our homes, they're not always athletes. Um, they're sometimes perch potatoes. I mean, this one right behind me right now is, is uh, showing us what a perch potato looks like. Um, he is, I try to get him pretty active, but he's also good at being a perch potato. Um, and if I let him be a perch potato all the time, I could potentially be uh, predisposing him to something like this happening. Um, chronic inflammatory conditions, as we talked about as well in that sort of pathophysiology of how atherosclerotic plaques develop, we know that there's an inflammatory component to it. So there has been some theories that if there are chronic inflammatory states within the body, we could potentially have this develop. Okay, so what are the signs? Um, early signs, there may be no, no signs because it depends on what vessels are affected. If it's something where there may be some more collateral blood flow to a portion of the body, you may see nothing at all and everything could be fine. But in more advanced stages, you could have sudden death. Um, the birds may be lethargic. They may have neurologic signs. In one study, it was found that birds with atherosclerosis were eight times more likely to have neurologic problems than birds that didn't have the disease. Uh, you may see respiratory problems. You may see exercise intolerance. If they go into congestive heart failure, the abdomen could be more distended. Um, you can even sometimes see certain skin problems because you're not getting good blood flow to the skin. And then also feather loss and um, dry skin in particular parts of the body. Okay, so I know we're getting close to the end here. I want to at least leave a little time for photos, or not photos, uh, questions. So I want to just go over these, a couple of photos real quick first though. Um, so how do, we, how do we diagnose atherosclerosis? It is a very hard disease to diagnose definitively before a patient has passed away. Unfortunately, that is the reality. We really actually need to have histopathology, which means a segment of a blood vessel is taken, it's put underneath a microscope, and we look at it and we say, aha, we see the plaques. Um, but that is something that happens after a bird passes away. We need to get better at diagnosing it before a bird passes away from it so that we can do something about it. Uh, we can do things like blood work where we can look at fat levels. We can do imaging studies. This right here, I have some photos for you of a bird that had atherosclerosis. Um, what it is showing is it's actually showing the uh, mineral densities that can be present within vessels. And so what I want to point your guys' eyes to, uh, if you haven't looked at x-rays before on birds, it may be something that's like, I don't even know what's going on. Um, but this here is the bird's heart and the liver is down here. You can see this little bright area right over the side of the heart here. And you can see this little bright area down over by the liver. Now, when you take an x-ray, you're taking a three-dimensional animal and pushing it down into two dimensions. So even though I'm saying it's over the heart, it's over the liver. It doesn't mean it's associated with the heart or the liver. We take a second image and here it is down here and you can see the heart, the liver's down here. Here's actually the stomach. You can see those little bright spots right there and bright spots over here and bright spots over here. If you look, this is actually a silhouette of the great vessels branching off of the heart. And so these little bright spots here are actually mineral densities that are within that 
uh, those vessels. And this one back here is the celiac artery, which if you remember going back to the um, pictures I had beforehand, um, the celiac artery is one of the main ones that's branching down to the stomach. Um, the, that's mineralized. These are all mineralized. Mineralizations within the, the vascular uh, system is something that's seen with atherosclerosis. Now, we can do other diagnostics. We can do things like CT scans with contrast to try and see if maybe we can find some lesions where there might be narrowing. We can check blood pressures. There are some limitations with that in birds, um, but these things can give us some clues as to whether or not atherosclerosis may be present. This is actually a bird um, that I adopted. She had atherosclerosis amongst many other problems. She also had an egg sitting in the back of her. Um, that was the least of her problems, um, but she was in congestive heart failure. So if we go back up to this image here, see how much black you can see in this portion of the body versus when we go down here, there's just a little bit of black. This is her lungs. She should have black back here in her air sacs, and she doesn't. And the reason she doesn't is because that's fluid that's in there. So she had atherosclerosis, and it caused fluid to build up um, down in her, like, uh, in the lower portion of her salomic cavity. Um, and then here's another picture of a bird that had atherosclerosis. And this bird actually has a very, very large heart. You can see this portion, uh, this side of the heart sort of looks okay. Okay, you can't really, it doesn't look too bit too bad. But then when you look at this side, see how wide it is over here? It should look symmetrical. Like I should be able to take this x-ray and sort of like fold it in half on top of each other, right on this central line here. It should kind of look pretty similar one side to the other. And it's not, this side is very irregular. And we've got this big bulging over here with the heart. Now I will warn you, I do have a, um, a, a, a necropsy photo next. So if anybody doesn't like to see necropsy photos, I will only stay on the slide for a moment. I will let you know when I am off of it. Um, but there is a necropsy photo next. So we're going to go on to that. Unfortunately, this bird did pass away. This bird it came in too advanced with its atherosclerosis and had to be put to sleep. When we put her to sleep, this is her heart. Um, this, that big bulge we saw, this is one of the atria of her heart. This is the other side. This is more normal. This thing is gigantic. This is her liver here. It's a little bit rounded and irregular. Um, and then this is the great vessels. This is her brachiocephalic trunk that's branching here. We did find that she had atherosclerosis. This is just another picture of it. This is sort of the side that looks okay as far as the atria size. This is the atria that's really big and dilated and irregular. And then when we took the heart out, this is actually um, the left side of the heart. This is that um, tricuspid valve. And that's actually a little atherosclerotic plaque that's actually on um, uh, a portion there of that heart. So, okay, the, uh, the pictures are off for anybody who does not like to see anatomy photos. Um, so unfortunately for that bird, that, that patient, she was too advanced. Um, now, there are some things that we can do when we have atherosclerosis. We can sometimes put them, I, I put a variety of things that are possible. We can put them on vasodilators, so things that try to take that narrow vessel wall and open it up a little bit. It's not going to get rid of the plaque, but it's trying to dilate blood vessels, so you're trying to get a little bit better blood flow around the body. Because Remember, the main problem that happens with birds with atherosclerosis is ischemia, or poor oxygen delivery to tissues. So we put them on vasodilators, so we dilate blood vessels, trying to get better oxygen delivery to tissues. There's also medications that you can give that kind of affect the mobility of a red blood cell, because what's moving through the, the lumen of the, the um, blood vessel? Well, red blood cells, right? And fluid. And so sometimes we can put them on medications that make red blood cells a little more flexible so they can kind of get through those areas that are a little more narrow. If we have a bird who's in congestive heart failure, sometimes they need to be on various other medications, um, antidiuretics, positive inotrope medications. Um, dietary adjustments are important, not so much that they are going to change what is already there, but to try to prevent problems further. Um, omega-3 fatty acids, even though they are a fatty acid, they actually have been shown to lower triglyceride levels in birds. And there was actually a study in cockatiels that showed that. Um, and so that's something that could be a helpful adjunct. And there's our studies that show that birds who have higher omega-3 fatty acids in their tissues um, had less atherosclerotic lesions. 
So how do we prevent it? Um, good diet, getting them on a good diet, making sure that they are not getting high amounts of fats because we do know that at least there is a high fat component to this disease. We don't always know exactly how that high fat necessarily totally contributes to the disease. That is still sort of like the exact mechanism of how it's still trying to be figured out, but um, we know that at least it's a contributing factor. Get them exercise, let them, let them fly around, let them do what they're supposed to play with their toys, run around the house, uh, you know, let them be birds uh, so that they can burn off some of those calories, just like us. It's good, it's good to have exercise. Uh, some some people will put omega-3 fatty acids in the bird's diet pre preventatively. Um, we don't know yet that it really truly works as a preventative. There's some studies that support that it potentially could, um, but it is something that you could do. It's not going to hurt. Um, and so there's some, also some other possible heart healthy foods for those individuals who like to um, try to incorporate, uh, you know, fresh foods into that, which is certainly, certainly um recommended as part of the diet. And here's some potential things that may have some benefits. There's some benefits that we know about in other animals regarding these particular things. We don't know about it in birds so much, but it's a possibility. So, all right. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I know we're getting close to the end. I'm sorry that I didn't leave a lot of time for questions, but uh, I am happy to answer any questions that anybody has. No, those are great. Uh, that was great. We do have a lot of questions, a lot, a lot of um, interested in this topic. And just, just as I wait for a question to come, I was um, just thinking, man, we should probably do like a, uh, a, a, a weekly like Pilates or, or exercise class that people could log on to and, you know, we yeah. do all these exercises together. So it's yep. a bird friendly, bird friendly uh, exercise class, uh, uh, a Zooming, you know, over Zoom. All right. So uh, Dr. Lamb, um, we have a question from Susanna. Uh, Susanna, um, uh, if a bird is slightly obese due to age and not being eager to fly a lot, uh, being more of a walker, is it prone to having um, heart disease? Well, if they're obese, yes, that is one of the risk factors for atherosclerosis. Um, so, but, you know, getting them to walk is a form of exercise too, you know, so if they walk more, but they don't fly, it, yeah, we want them to fly. It, it's kind of is, you know, what they have been designed to do. But if they aren't able to do that for one reason or another, um, then walking is an okay thing to do as well. <laughs> and the gentle wing flapping, maybe if you kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And... I've known some people who like their bird is clipped, you know, because they can't have them fly to for again, one reason or another, but they'll like walk around them with the room, like, and walk fastly with the bird um, and let the bird sort of like fly in their hand essentially. <laughs> and so they could uh, help them to fly around sort of. Yeah. I know another trick is um, a long ladder. You, if you have them climb up and then you reverse the ladder so that they have to do it again, like, like climbing yeah. up a ladder along. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's see. We have, we have so many questions that, um, you know, we might have to do a follow-up webinar if you don't mind, because oh, yeah. <laughs> um, this, this topic generated um, just, we have so many people interested in, in, in finding out more. Um, yeah, uh, that was fascinating. And just, just, you know, I had a question for you about, um, have you seen like dramatic turnarounds from a bird that comes in with congestional heart failure or atherosclerosis and, and through working, you know, with the right health regimen that get total life turnaround or? I, I, before they get into congestive heart failure, because when you get into, con when you get into congestive heart failure, there are some studies that show, okay, and we need more studies in birds, but there are some, there's some statistics that show once you go into congestive heart failure, you don't have a lot, a good length of life left. But if you're not in congestive heart failure and we have a patient who we highly, highly, highly suspect has atherosclerosis and we get them on the medications, I have had some patients who did make some pretty dramatic return turnarounds um, that are still on their medications and we're several years into this with treating them and they're doing well. Now, I will say, because there's going to be people who listen to this webinar and go, well, how does she know that they actually had atherosclerosis? And whoever says that, they're absolutely right. I cannot definitively say that those birds have atherosclerosis until they pass away, because I can't say that until I have histopathologic evidence to confirm the diagnosis. But I have risk factors uh, for a particular individual, signs that fit specifically with that particular problem. And then we put them on the medications that we think are the most helpful and you see a dramatic turnaround. Um, and there's some of those patients that I've tried to take off the medications, wondering if it was just a coincidence and had them go right back to having their same problems. So, um, you know, it's something that 
we still have a lot to learn. We need to get better at how to diagnose an antemortem, but there are several patients I've had that are doing well on their medications for atherosclerosis with the presumptive diagnosis that that is what they have. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Um, again, we, we, we probably, we have so many questions. We definitely, definitely would love to do a follow-up webinar um, with you to, to go over some of these uh, really good questions that people have about um, cardiac uh, health. And um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's all we have time for today with the questions that will be on here for like a couple hours. If we, if we well, yeah, if you guys want to do a follow-up on this one, on any of the questions, we could always do that. I know we've done that in the past before for other ones. Um, and so I'd be happy to do that because I know this one definitely is probably going to generate a ton of questions. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's great to, to, you know, have such an interest because uh, it's just one more way that we're looking out for our birds. Um, and again, you know, February is heart health. So maybe, uh, maybe schedule that if you haven't scheduled your, uh, you know, check up with your vet. Uh, maybe, maybe this will be a catalyst to, to kind of get things looked at too. If you have any questions. Um, oh, I got to get to our winner. We, we have our giveaway. Um, so uh, just like with our webinars, we have a, a today's, um, today's winner is going to get a, uh, what Arroyo was, was showcasing to us earlier in the video, uh, the classic Abbey cakes, as well as another product of your birds choosing. And that winner is David K. So congratulations, David. Uh, hopefully that'll make you and your birds day. And uh, just going to give you a highlight of what we have coming up in our next webinar series. We've got uh, February 18th, I believe that's next Friday, uh, the gray way, uh, the healthy gray, uh, keeping your bird healthy and happy. And that's with uh, Lisa Bono. And that'll be um, at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, and then, uh, boy, February is such a short month. The end of February, we got February 25th, Ask the Vet with Dr. Uh, Tom Tully. So on that note, just wanted to say, uh, Dr. Lamb, this is a this is a great way to start our, our 2022 webinar series with you. I think you are first uh, from the get-go when we started these webinars. So, so it's always uh, it's always so nice that, that you take your time and uh, join us on, on your busy Friday. So everyone, no everyone Glad to help. This. making our birds uh, healthier and happier with, with all the all the all the time that you give to us. So again, awesome. thank you. And and Arroyo. Now Arroyo was doing some exercises at the beginning of the webinar. I don't know if you noticed. But, Yes, he was trying to show everybody how to exercise. <laughs> yeah, and now he's chilling. So, all right. Until next time, everybody, everyone, um, have, be, have a great weekend and all the best to you and your flock and be safe. Till next time. Bye. Doc. Thanks, Dr. Lamb. Bye.